Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Nice to see you all here. Uh, before we launch into this, I just want to say a word of gratitude to Father John Herman and the Morrow Seminary community for your hospitality tonight. Thank you so much for having us. And as always, a word of thanks to the Martin family, to John S. and Virginia Martin, who uh, have made so much possible in terms of the renewal of preaching. I want to say a word of thanks to them. I know there'll be uh, some, of, some of the members of the family will be watching the video. So let's give them a round of applause. Too. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, Monsignor Stephen C. Basso. Probably needs no introduction to most of us here. For those of us CSEs who live in the Corby community on campus, he has been an amiable table companion at Corby since early August. And many of you MDiv students know him as the Fall 2021 Martin Visiting Faculty Fellow in Preaching and the instructor for Preaching 2. Ordained in 1978, Monsignor Basso is a native of Pensacola, Florida, and he is a priest of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tall Tallahassee. He regularly, he regularly reports to us on the activities of his bishop, <laughs> Bill Walk, CSE. Well, I know you're watching the video tomorrow. <laughs> Your preaching is great, don't worry. Uh, Steve comes to us from St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary, Seminary in Boynton Beach, Florida, where he has served in various capacities since 1985. Among those roles, he has been a spiritual director, served several years as the academic dean, and did a five-year stint as the rector president of the seminary. Currently, he is a professor of sacred scripture, biblical languages, and homiletics at St. Vincent de Paul. He holds a licentiate in, this, in sacred scripture from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, as well as a doctor of ministry, doctor of ministry in preaching degree from the Aquinas Institute in St. Louis. His demon thesis was entitled "Best Preaching Practices in Homiletic Programs in Roman Catholic Theologates in the United States." Tonight he will assist us in kicking off a theology department initiative that we are calling Preaching Across the Curriculum. That would be the MDiv curriculum. More on that another time. His lecture is entitled The Importance of Preaching in the Theological Curriculum. Please give a warm Notre Dame welcome to Monsignor Steve Boston. Thank you. And I want to uh, say a word of thanks to the uh, Martin family uh, for the uh, fellowship and uh, certainly to Father Mike Connors uh, and to the, um, uh, Dr. Tim for the uh, invitation to be here for um, the 2021 uh, Martin Fellowship uh, Professor of Homiletics. Um, I'd like to uh, begin in a good Catholic tradition uh, with a reading from sacred scripture for our presentation this evening, again, the importance of preaching in a theological curriculum. And the reading, uh, being a professor of scripture and teaching synoptics, is from uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Now, Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And his disciples answered and said, Some say you're John the Baptist returned from the dead. Others say Elijah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus answered and said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him in reply, Thou art the Logos, existing in the Father as his rationality. And then by an act of his will, being generated, in consideration of the various functions by which God is related to his creation, but only on the fact that Scripture speaks of a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, each member of the Trinity being co-equal with each other member, and each acting inseparably with and interpenetrating each other member, with only an economy of subordination within God, but causing no division 
which would make the substance no longer simple. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said, What? <laughs> now, <laughs> in this day and age where you have to give your sources, I wish that I could say that I came up with that, uh, but I didn't. It comes from the Stewardship of Life uh, organization, uh, which is uh, founded in 1994. It's headquartered at the United Lutheran Seminary with campuses in Philadelphia and Gettysburg. The Institute's mission is to serve stewardship in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So we have to give credit to the Stewardship of Life for that. But it's kind of a good introduction in terms of a point I would like to try to make this evening of the importance of uh, preaching in a theological curriculum. As I go through this presentation, um, I will occasionally kind of uh, remind us uh, what we're doing here this evening. And the reason is, is not because it's overly complicated, but rather to try to uh, accentuate my point about preaching in a theological curriculum. Um, I could have also have entitled the presentation, and some of you uh, maybe who are older might remember this adage, good academic theology makes for solid pastoral theology. Good academic theology makes for solid pastoral theology. The immediate historical background that I'd like to start from, and again, it'll be very quick, uh, in terms of homiletics or preaching in the Catholic tradition, I'd like to actually go back to the Council of Trent. Um, and at the Council of Trent, of course, during the time of the, um, and I'm not a, uh, a church historian by training, um, but at the Council of Trent, uh, in response to the uh, Protestant Reformation, the church did a number of things, uh, and certainly within the context of Scripture, uh, what was important for us is the closing of the canon, uh, you know, proclaiming the church uh, holding 72 books, whereas the Protestants had 66. Some will argue that it goes back to Augustine. Um, I would certainly uh, welcome that. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that um, people do not determine canon. Councils determine canon. And so if you're studying early church history, you'll see where uh, you'll have these different... Uh, writers of the early church and the early church uh, um, who have list of uh, the canons. But again, it's, it's, that, it's the idea that, again, people don't determine, individuals don't determine, determine the canon, the councils of the church do. They also um, uh, proclaim the doctrinal inspiration. Uh, that may not sound that important, um, but on a pastoral level, uh, and again, it's very complicated, it's another reason for another talk, um, your doctrine or your, your, your theory of inspiration, there's a theory of inspiration which you hold, will directly impact upon your preaching. What you hold in terms of how the scriptures are inspired will determine in a very direct way how you preach and what you preach. The third thing, one of the, th again, the council did a number of things, was to determine the uh, seven sacraments. And all of this, I take as a very uh, fundamental point in terms of solidifying a basis in our Catholic tradition uh, for what will be uh, presented this evening. The stress laid upon um, Catholics, at least in terms of the liturgy uh, of the Mass, was the importance of Sunday participation. Um, what, but the, when, the, when the church stresses that, they probably didn't realize what the, you know, the domino effect was going to be in terms of the consequences uh, decades or even centuries later. And what it comes down to us, and some of you who are younger may not even realize this was, or maybe have maybe even heard this, but um, when I was growing up, and for a lot of people here who are my age group, um, the discussion among Catholics um, was, what's the latest I can possibly come to Mass and the earliest I can leave, and still consider to have fulfilled my Sunday obligation, you know, where I took the little time card and ching ching, you know, no mortal sin. And that was, uh, now thank God, praise God, the church has the wisdom never to even address the issue. Uh, because some would say, well, it's the gospel. Others would say, um, 
No, it's the offertory. If you asked any pastor, they would tell you, uh, if you missed the Sunday collection, you missed Mass. <laughs> Pastors are smart people. They've got to pay light bills. Um, but it was, it was, it was this, this whole uh, uh, movement towards minimalism um, of, the, uh, of, of the sacraments. Um, and again, I'll demonstrate this with a, with a few examples. Um, in terms of um, prior to the council, um, the liturgy of the word was unimportant. Homilies were unimportant. The idea of preaching was unimportant. And the reason is because the church was uh, very emphatic about the idea of the liturgy of the Eucharist. And therefore, the liturgy of the word, if, you, if the term can even be used, uh, and in fact, I'll, it, it wasn't used. If you take an old St. Joseph missal and you look at it where the Latin's on one side and the English is on the other, what does it say about the beginning of Mass? It was called the Mass of the Catechumen. Look it up. And then when you get to the offertory, it's the Mass of the Faithful. And so the, the message that was being sent was that the liturgy of the Word, the readings, uh, the scriptures, and the homily was unimportant. It just, it, it really um, had no value whatsoever. Um, Minimalism was operative prior to the council. Uh, and again, that's a general statement. You, you know, it's a, um, but for instance, and again, those of us who are older will remember that the Easter vigil prior to the council was sometimes celebrated, in, fact, in a lot of places, was celebrated on Holy Saturday morning at 9 or 10 a.m. And if you ask older folks, especially, you know, the guys my age, uh, we served those Masses, and you literally would go to Mass, you'd go to church on Saturday morning, Holy Saturday, uh, and you would do the Easter Vigil. Again, it was, it was, but you've got to also remember that with the reforms of the Council, uh, one of the reforms that the Council brought in was the idea of uh, the restored liturgy, but also the Easter Triduum. Now, Pius XII tried to restore that during his time, but by and large, most people would hold, at least in, who I'm in, you know, talking with, that it was not that successful. That uh, Pius XII tried restoring it, and it was a good attempt, but it was only with the council and the reforms of the council um, that, the, uh, that that actually took uh, any, any effect. In terms of like at the Easter Vigil, you have the, uh, the people coming into the church, the catechumens, um, and the, uh, the, the idea of the Easter Vigil taking place uh, at sundown. Um, I'm from Florida, and um, some people say that the uh, state image should not be an orange. It should be a car, uh, and you're looking at the back of the car, and it's a plump of gray hair <laughs> in the steering wheel. That that should be the Florida symbol because of the number of elderly people which we have in the state, um, that, which, which may be true. Um, but, but in reality, you know, when you start talking about the idea of uh, the reforms, uh, one of the reforms, again, was the idea of the Easter Vigil. Well, to, to this day, honest to God, to this day, in Florida, you have pastors that still celebrate the Easter Vigil at the 4 p.m. Saturday evening Mass. A good friend of mine, God bless John, I love him to death, he literally had light the Easter candle with a Bic lighter because he smoked like a fiend. And he would say, and he would use the excuse, my parishioners are older and we can't have a fire. We might have to call the fire department at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Anyway, uh, another example of kind of the minimalism, and again, I'll try to be short on this one, uh, was on Holy Thursday. The emphasis on Holy Thursday prior to the council um, wasn't so much against the, the liturgy of the word, the, um, the emphasis was literally the movement uh, after the Mass where the altar would be stripped and the movement was the procession to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so the big thing was decorating the altar of reserve. And if you talk with older people, and it, it's, it's, become, it's coming back with a vengeance, people will go sometimes to six, eight, ten churches visiting and what they're visiting, and again... 
you have to be careful how I say this because it sounds like, you know, oh, you don't sound very Catholic. Um, contrary is true, but, um, you know, what does the altar look like where the Blessed Sacrament is being reserved? In other words, the emphasis is on that procession and what the altar reserve is, look, is looking like in terms of adoration until the adoration is closed. The emphasis was not upon the liturgy of the word um, and upon the homily. What's interesting uh, is that as the council makes this reform, uh, they add in the idea of the washing of the feet, which is optional, mind you. But the emphasis shifts from, and again, the, the big thing now isn't the stripping of the altar after the Holy Thursday service, but again, the emphasis is upon the idea of the washing of the feet, going back to the scriptures. And now my claim is that when the uh, church does this, they you know, do the washing of the feet, it's kind of like, you know, I, I use the term, it's like a liturgical prop. You know, it's, you, know you hear the reading, and then uh, they do the washing of the feet. Uh, now, some people don't like that. In fact, when Pope Francis started going to prisons and washing the feet of prisoners, especially non-Catholic Muslims, men and women, and, you know, even the youth, there was this loud outcry against him. What's he doing, you know? He's ruining the washing of the feet. Uh, totally missing the point <laughs> of what the symbolism, taking John's gospel and the washing of the feet and trying to, it will, it, to incarnate it, to make it real. Just missing the point completely. And as I would say, missing the uh, forest for the trees. Another example, uh, and again for the ordination. People don't realize, but uh, prior to the council, now they have started to change this a little bit. But priest, when you were ordained a priest, you were ordained what's called a, a sacerdotus simplex. And what simplex meant was that for three years, you could not preach, nor could you, the other part was not that you were, the pastors were more worried about the pastors than the assistants, but uh, you couldn't hear confessions. So you couldn't preach, you couldn't hear confessions. And so for three years after the ordination, you would have to go to the chantry to report to the chantry, and you would be examined by the bishop, the vicar general, the chancellor, and the judicial vicar on issues of confession and preaching. So in all of this, there was a kind of a minimalism. But the side effect of it is the idea that preaching was just not important. And it was pretty clear it was not important. Um, so when it comes to, uh, and again, this is, uh, this is my thesis, uh, at least for this presentation this evening, um, and my thesis for preaching across the curriculum. I submit that the, relation, the relationship between the homiletic curriculum and the study of theology and the preparation of the priest was a consequence of this minimalism. That's just a theory of mine. It's not important, so don't worry about training them for it because it's not that important in terms of preaching. We've got the Eucharist, and again, yeah, we do have the Eucharist. Thank God, you know, it's, God bless us, we have the Eucharist. But the emphasis was on the Eucharist and not on homiletics. Historically, at least, in freestanding theologates, freestanding would mean this, this is how it's defined. Uh, you're not a freestanding theologate at Moreau. You're associated with the university. A freestanding theologate would be a seminary that's not associated with a college or a university. It's freestanding. So St. Vincent de Paul uh, is freestanding. Uh, Notre Dame in New Orleans is freestanding. Uh, St. John's of Camarillo, uh, um, St. John's of Camarillo, uh, California is freestanding. All these places that, again, the diocese uh, or different dioceses own or sometimes religious community own the seminary. Um, but the, uh, and when it came to getting faculty for homiletics, a lot of times the bishop would just say uh, to a guy, uh, you know, hey, you're a good preacher. Um, you go teach at the seminary. Go teach homiletics. And the guy might say, well, I don't, I don't, don't know how to teach. You're a good preacher. Just go to the seminary and teach. Now, if some guy came to a seminary, any free seminary, and said to the rector, uh, I want to teach uh, church history or moral theology or scripture. 
The first question they would ask is, well, what credentials do you have? Well, I don't have any credentials. Well, you're not teaching systematic theology or biblical scripture if you don't have credentials. But the two areas where you could, pre, where you could teach in a freestanding theology, and maybe even in other seminaries, was homiletics and liturgical practicum. You needed absolutely no credentials. And a lot of times what would happen in freestanding theology, say, for instance, I had, uh, was teaching two core courses in an elective this semester, and the elective didn't go, uh, didn't have enough students, so the elective wasn't going. Uh, the academic dean or the rector might say to me, uh, you're teaching homiletics. Well, I don't know anything about homiletics. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. You're teaching homiletics. Homiletics became the red-headed stepchild in theological curricula, in seminaries. It was unimportant. Um, a friend of mine, uh, who we started in Rome together in 1981, he did his doctorate in biblical theology at the Gregg, at the Gregorian University, and uh, was studying for the uh, Diocese of Cleveland. He finished his degree, his doctorate in biblical theology, uh, we finished at the same time in 1985, and he told me later that when he came home, the bishop said to him, oh, you're also teaching homiletics. And he said, well, I don't have any credentials in homiletics. And the bishop's response is, you don't need, it's, it's preaching for God's sake, you don't, you just, just teach it. Now, the guy was a good preacher, but you see what I mean? It, in the theological curriculum, homiletics, again, the phrase I use, it was the red-headed stepchild. It was not important. Where did the change come? In the Second Vatican Council, in the reforms of the council, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, the church gets serious about the liturgical reforms. And if you read the document itself, Sacrosanctum Concilium, it says from the very beginning, in the first three paragraphs, the importance, and they say, the reforms of the liturgy. And, and that's what it was. How to make you know, the liturgical expression in terms of the uh, faith. Um, and it's very simple. It has to be simple, but yet be understood. And so what they do is they talk about the importance of the liturgy of the word and the importance of the homily. And they define the homily as part of the liturgy. Now this has tantamount effects and probably maybe someone in the council or some of the, uh, the, you know, the, the bishops, the, the cardinals, realized the importance of what they were up against. I'm not sure if they realized the consequences of what it meant in terms of now you have to, if you've got something that's important and it's part of the liturgy, um, what are you going to do about it? But yet, still, for a long, long time, um, it's that, it's, in some seminaries it still is. That gave me the catalyst, really, for my doctoral dissertation, for my project, was to check and see how many, how many theologates, you know, the ones that I surveyed, and at the time there were 39, I won't do all 39, and the uh, <laughs> review committee said, no, you're not doing 39, it's, you, you'll never get finished with this thing. Do six or seven. So I picked, selected six or seven seminaries um, to find out. But one of the things was, uh, what is the teaching faculty like in the homiletics department? To my surprise, I, in fact, I'll be honest with you, it was a shock when I finished the research. That was just one aspect of the research. Every seminary I interviewed had credentialed faculty in homiletics. That finally, it's not, it's not that way everywhere still to this day. Some seminaries still do not have them. But more and more seminaries and more and more dioceses are uh, requiring that the people in homiletics have, be trained in homiletics, pastoral theology with uh, doctoral credentials. In terms of, again, and the message is what? It's important. That's the message that's being sent. But the difficulty, and I'm going to give a quote from uh, Walter Burkhardt, is that traditionally it just was not important. It just wasn't. Um, the, um, as, as, as now the, the liturgy becomes important and the homily becomes important, uh, the emphasis on the liturgy of the word, interesting enough, theologians, theologians, now start looking at the place of preaching and homiletics in seminary curriculum. And not only in that, but the importance of preaching in terms of the history of the church. So part one has been to try to set up, you know, the, the situation, the historical situation of where we found ourselves. 
Uh, the second part I want to move and to look at, in fact, uh, and I, what I want to do again is to, to keep fo the focus on the idea of the importance of homiletics. And what I'm going to do is to move to part two of this presentation to look at different people, theologians, who felt that the homiletics was important in terms of the seminary curriculum and in the preparation for ministers in the church, both ordained and, as you have here, for non-ordained. Um, the first person, the first group I'm going to look at is uh, Raymond Brown, Carolyn Osiak, and Femi Perkins. And their importance in terms of looking at the first century of the church's history and dividing it into three kind of easily dividable, uh, it's probably more convenient in terms of the years than actually is the reality. But the first phase is the, uh, the three stages of uh, the first century, the first stage is the life of Jesus himself preaching. The second stage would be the life of the apostolic uh, period. And then the third stage is what's called the sub-apostolic or the post-apostolic period. And in dividing it, uh, what they've done is basically, and you, you, this, this, some of this material may just be, you may, you may know it already, it just from a, you know, a course in, uh, if you take Paul's epistles, uh, the letters of Paul or synoptic gospels. Um, because that second phase in terms of like the development of the Gospels is called the oral stage. And that's the stage of the preaching. And it's, you know, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one who begins the letter writing. You know, what becomes later will be part of the uh, New Testament canon. But at this phase, it's literally, it's just preaching. There's nothing being written. And the preaching, uh, one of the reasons it's given for the preaching stage is that the expectation of the imminent return of Jesus. Well, if he's coming back, we're just going to be preaching. And so that it stays in that oral stage. But when we get to the language, it's going to be very important in terms of the language that's being used, specifically in terms of uh, uh, language that's used for the idea of preaching. Um, when we look at the vocabulary, and again, I, I'm going to throw some words out. I don't want to get stuck up on it uh, because, again, I... <laughs> It's Greek, and I could spend all night just talking about that, but uh, I'll try not to bore you too horribly with, uh, with it. Um, but the word, um, but it becomes important in this century, uh, last century also, um, the words to preach, um, keruso, or the preacher, uangalizo, to preach the good news, all of that language now becomes important, and that's the language you're going to start seeing appearing in the New Testament. In fact, and I just want to isolate one example, and that is uh, on the road to Emmaus. Now, when you're dealing with Luke's gospel and with Luke and theology and Luke and language and vocabulary, um, when you, um, you know, it's some of the best Greek. Uh, it, it almost comes very, very, it comes very, very close to being almost a classical Greek. But it's, and his vocabulary is huge. Um, in terms of the Greek vocabulary. Obviously a very well uh, educated man. Um, but he himself said, as he does in the beginning of his gospel, um, that he was not an eyewitness to Jesus. Um, he states it very clearly. Uh, what he's got has been passed on to him. And, uh, but he uses a lot of different vocabulary. Uh, homileo, where we get the, uh, to homilize, to, hom to preach. Um, the word antibalo, uh, anti plus the word logos, means to discuss. And all this, if you look at the road to Emmaus, uh, it, it's just this constant uh, influx of language. Sumbalo, um, tsun the word hologos. That little simple story from uh, the road to Emmaus is chocked full of language that's in the semantic field of preaching and to preach and to pass on to discuss. And so all of this vocabulary becomes important in terms of uh, the church starts identifying in terms of that, that particular word. Um, it, it, so that becomes in terms of the, uh, the, the language itself is important. Um, again, all of this is still in the oral stage uh, as it's being moved to the written stage. The next important person, again, from, at least from my presentation, from, in my mind, uh, in terms of looking at preaching 
and the importance of preaching uh, is the work of C.H. Dodd. Um, it's an older work, but to me it's a very important work because what Dodd does, C.H. Dodd does, is he's trying to look at apostolic preaching and he's looking at it, apostolic preaching from the point of view of what was the basic charisma. What was the most important thing being taught about being a Christian? Dodd's, one of his points in his book on apostolic preaching and its development is that the preachers of the New Testament were Christians preaching to a non-Christian world. And he makes a big point of that in terms of the charisma. He draws this distinction at the end of his work, uh, this conclusion um, about showing the difference between the Pauline charisma and the Jerusalem charisma. Now, that work is improved upon later on, and I'll allude to that uh, when I come to Fitzmaier. Uh, but the importance, I think the importance of Dodd is that he, he, he sets, a, 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 at least he, he, he trips something. He says, wait a second. Preaching is important. Our church was founded on preaching. Therefore, in the contemporary world, preaching is important. He even takes it a step further and he says, you know, the difficulty with preachers today, and he doesn't talk about boring homilies, he says the difficulty and the real challenge is you've got preaching, preachers preaching to people who what? Your faith has saved you. You're preaching to people who have already been saved. People have already heard the word. What new do you say? I've said, I said it to the, uh, the class I'm teaching now, and I've said it for years and it's, it's kind of an embarrassment, but, I mean, the reality is the reality. Folks, the, the, the toughest day for me personally to preach is Christmas and Easter. <laughs> what are you going to say new? He wasn't born in Bethlehem? Okay, he was born in Nazareth. Okay, I'll get that argument. Okay. Uh, he didn't rise from the dead? I mean, what are you going to say? How do you preach the good news to people that already believe in the resurrection, or people that celebrate, you know, annually this, this festivity. I talked about the idea of the annual uh, celebration and the homily, this annual celebration uh, of Christmas. What do you say? What's new? What do I do with this? How do I preach to those who already have heard the good news? The next person I think that's important um, in the development, again, the, again I'm going to kind of raise my head again and say, the thing I'm trying to do to establish isn't so much the importance of preaching, that, but the importance of homiletics in a theological curriculum. Are we still, in homiletics, the, you know, red-headed stepchild among theologians? And when I point to St. Augustine, Augustine... Um, you know, in his uh, De Doctrina Christiana, it's four books. And uh, I'm going to defer to an article uh, by Charles Kenningeser, who um, makes a point about the reason that, in his speculation, his mind, um, that Augustine wrote the first two and a half books. And he makes three major points. And one point, the starting point is, well, first of all, he wanted to establish himself as a reputable expositor of the sacred scriptures. And, in fact, after his ordination, according to Canon Geezer, that, you know, uh, he spent, asked, just after he was ordained, can you imagine being ordained, okay, you just got ordained, and then you tell your superior, or you tell your bishop, uh, I want three years off to just spend time studying the scriptures. I don't know about superiors, but I sure as hell know what a bishop would say. <laughs> it ain't going to be pleasant. Get your, you know what, to work at you know, this parish or that parish. Uh, you know, you've had your time for studying. It's called seminary. But Augustine wanted to establish himself. Secondly, Canon Geezer makes the point that uh, his, the, the reason is he, was a, he, he knew his work and trade uh, as a teacher of rhetoric. What he had to do was to establish himself as someone in rhetoric marrying Scripture. And so the first two and a half books are on the interpretation of Scripture. Twenty years later, 
Augustine writes the end of chapter 3 and the book 4, book 3 and book 4 of De Doctrina Christiana. And again, I defer to uh, Charles Kennengeiser, who argues that the reason it took him 20 years is that he was a little bit confused about a friend of his, a guy named Tokenitis, who was a Donatist, lived around the same time. Uh, Tokenitis, in fact, wrote a book called City of God before Augustine did. How about that? I'm glad I read that article by Ken and Geezer, okay? Uh, didn't know that. So anyway, but the, but, but the whole point is uh, Augustine. But the importance, again, of that I want to point to Augustine is his importance that he placed upon preaching, upon the interpretation of Scripture and the importance of preaching in De Doctrina Christiana. That preaching is important in terms of the life of the church. Uh, the next person I want to look at is Karl Rahner. Now, you may say, Karl Rahner is like, oh, my gosh, you know, what's he got to do with preaching? You know, I mean, you know, what was the, what's the joke about his brother Hugo when Hugo retired? What did Hugo say? The people said, what are you going to do, Hugo, now that you're retiring? And what did his brother say? I'm going to translate Karl into German. In other words, we think it's hard understanding. The Germans couldn't understand him. The Germans couldn't. Good luck for the Americans. Um, again, over 4,000 works they wrote, 23 volumes of uh, theological investigations. Um, and yet, he loves preaching. Harvey Egan, who was a student of his, and collected um, his homilies, translated and collected his homilies. And if you go back and read the homilies, and the, it, it's incredible. You read the homily and you think, wait a second, is this the same guy that wrote on the Trinity uh, that I can't understand or wrote on the sacraments that I have no clue as to what this guy is talking about? You read the homilies and they are so simple. It, it, it's mind-boggling. But he saw the importance of preaching. And just... I'm going to just take two examples and try to be quick about these. Um, on the fourth Sunday of Easter, we have the reading from uh, John chapter 10 on the Good Shepherd. And he, he literally, he does that, he uses John 10 and Psalm 23. And when you read it, I, I mean, it's just like, it's incredibly simple. But it's profound in terms of its simplicity, in terms of the conclusions that he draws. And again, the reason I'm saying this is because someone that, you know, who didn't, he didn't have to do this, but he loved preaching. A theologian of his stature saw the importance of preaching. And I think that, again, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a good signal that's being sent from theologians in terms of homilies. Uh, the, church, the title is The Great Church Year. It's his homilies, again. And it's, it, it's great reading. And literally... The second homily I wanted to point to, he gave a homily on Holy Saturday. The theme was Holy Saturday. And he talks about the idea of what is Holy Saturday. Ironically, ironically, the homily is less than one page. It's, it's like he took what he was saying about the simplicity of Holy Saturday, the bridge, the transition from you know, the tragedy of Good Friday to the exaltation of uh, the joy of Easter Sunday. And he talks about Holy Saturday as that quiet transition time, the ordinary, it's an ordinary day. And he uses that as an image for saying, you know what, for most of us, our lives are just ordinary. That Holy Saturday is a great feast, a great day of virtue and how we see virtue in the ordinary things of life. And again, you're reading and you're thinking, this is not written by Karl Rahner. It, it's too simple. It's too profound. The importance of preaching as seen by theologians. Next is Walter Burkhart, a patristic scholar. Um, someone, again, who, who's, uh, my God, he just spent 45 years with uh, uh, Theological studies, uh, 
written a good number of works. And then he, for some reason, decides, for whatever happened in terms of the grace of his life, to go into preaching. At 80 years old, at 80 years old, he starts the workshops on preaching for justice at 80. He wrote the book, wrote a, over 12 books on homily, homilies, collected homilies. But he wrote the book, Preaching the Art and the Craft. Here you have someone who is, again, a renowned scholar, a patristic scholar, much like Canon Geeser. And Canon Geeser wrote uh, on a number of preachings as well, like St. John Chrysostom. And again, the importance of the idea of for a theologian to go into preaching. He gives four caveats about preaching. He said the reason that preachers are um, not good preachers, he gives four reasons. First reason, fear of the sacred scriptures. They're afraid of the scriptures. Again, it's the Protestant thing. Fear of the scriptures. I don't know the scriptures. I can celebrate the sacraments, do well with anointing of the sick, but when it comes to the idea of preaching on the scriptures, I'm afraid to. I don't know if I'm saying, what I'm saying is right. The second, fear of theology. And his, and his point about fear of theology is a lot of, a lot of us, in terms of priests, you get ordained and you think, I don't need one more day of continuing education. I don't have to go to another workshop. I don't have to do anything for continuing education. Uh, again, it's this, just this ignorance of theology. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would go to a doctor that does not go for his annual renewal in terms of upgrading, in terms of having his license renewed because he has to continue education? Lawyers have to do it. Nurses have to do it. The clergy is one of the few professions we don't have to do a darn thing for renewing our license. Not a thing. Some people say, and you'll hear them say, I haven't picked up a book since ordination, and I'm damn well not going to. Fear of that. The next is another fear, or maybe, probably best puts it, an unawareness of prayer in the use of preparation for preaching. Oh, you mean, wait, wait a minute, let me see. You mean I'm supposed to pray while I'm thinking about my homily? <laughs> no, disconnect, disconnect, disconnect. I said my office, celebrate Mass. You know, Now I've got to go through that hard work of preparing the homily. No, 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 I'm not doing that. The fourth one, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to quote this one. And as the people in my class know, um, I rarely like to give long quotes this one was a pearl, or is a pearl. The fourth obstacle is the kind of evil, or kind of devil, that cannot be overcome even by prayer and fasting. The fourth obstacle is the kind of devil that cannot be overcome even by prayer and fasting. To me, the unprepared homilist is a menace. I do not minimize divine inspiration. I simply suggest it's rarely allotted to the lazy. He goes on and recounts a story that he heard when he was at Belmont Abbey by the famous Baptist biblicist and preacher Dale Moody. Moody was teaching at Louisville Seminary. He was teaching a course on the Holy Spirit. A student in the course wasn't meeting the professor's expectations. So Dr. Moody called him in and said to him in a very thick southern drawl, uh, he said, uh, son, you're not doing all that well in my course on the Holy Spirit. You've been studying? Oh, Dr. Moody, the young man replied, I don't have to study about the Spirit. I'm led by the Holy Spirit. Moody replied, son, that spirit ever lead you over to the library? <laughs> <laughs> he, 
If he doesn't soon, you'll be in deep trouble. <laughs> Burkhart goes on. The homilist is in deep trouble if the spirit does not lead him. Lead him to the chapel indeed, but also lead him to the library as well. Four obstacles to good preaching. He gives his solution for homily preparation. One is the obviously study, the importance of that. The second is experience. But not just experience of life experience, the experience of God. He talks about the idea of not knowing a theology of God, but do you know the God of theology? Your experience of God. Is there a reflective process where you get to know God, to understand God? And then third is proclamation, the idea of the preparation. The next I want to go through fairly quickly because I want to get to one again that's uh, with long uh, speaking a little more on. Uh, in terms of the preparation of this time, theologians now start the idea of working on the idea and in the area of homiletics and preaching. For those who are older, and you can probably still use his book, Reginald Fuller's book uh, on preaching the lectionary, great source. Done, he's a biblicist, uh, Luther, uh, not Lutheran, Episcopalian, I think, uh, Anglican. And, uh, but again, and he's written on all areas of systematic theology. But again, why would someone doing that take the time and the effort to put together a book on preaching the lectionary all three years? The message is preaching is important. And when the, when the theologians start saying it, then maybe it'll start, start having an effect in terms of maybe the people in homiletics are no longer the redhead stepchild. Maybe the idea of homiletics is important and preaching is important. Um, Joseph Fitzmaier. I don't know if you know this. Uh, God rest Joseph Fitzmaier. Uh, I studied at the Hebrew University for a year. And um, the, uh, all the professor, Jewish professors at the Hebrew University. And there's an article written. That you have to go through and learn modern Hebrew and stuff. And blah, 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 blah. And there's an article in modern Hebrew. And the article is on Joseph Fitzmaier written by one of the professors at the Hebrew University in modern Hebrew. And the article says, Joseph Fitzmaier is considered the world's best Aramaicist because what he did was he put the definitive work together or the work on the definitive breaking down of the five stages of the development of the Aramaic language. And again, respected by the Hebrew professors of the Hebrew University. His work in terms of his commentaries. And again, and, you know, he, he picks up with Dodd uh, left off. He took Dodd's work and said, wait a second. And he looks at the Jerusalem curriculum and the Pauline curriculum. And he says, well, and he kind of readjusts it. But the main thing is, again, you've got a, 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 this biblicist who's looking at the importance of preaching in the early church and the importance of preaching. Next person, Mary Catherine Hilkert. Now, the guys in my class know, and it's funny, when I met her, I said to her, kind of like, I'm, I'm you know, tongue-tied, saying, uh, you know, you know I, I've been using your book for like six years in my course, um, you know, <laughs> in homiletics, because I think it's so important in terms of the work you've done in uh, sacramental imagination, the art, you know, in terms of preaching, and the importance of that work. And... What I emphasize to the guys in my class, I emphasize to the guys back at St. Vincent's, is you have a systematic theologian who sees the importance of preaching. And this idea of sacramental preaching versus dialectical preaching very clearly, and how the two interweave. And, you know, she, many conclusions, and I'll try to cut this one really short because uh, she just got uh, so much to say. Um, I've literally got like a page and a half, and I'm a, I'm a cut, 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 because of the time, 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 time. Uh, but basically to say that what she has done for us is she has given us an anchor, or what I call a theological framework, on Catholic preaching using sacramental imagination. The key for me is taking theology and putting it into the context of preaching and the pragmatics of it the importance of it. You look at people again, and I'm just going to go through a list of people here at this point. Uh, people like Bishop Robert Behrens did his, doctorate, his doctoral thesis on Paul Tillich. The work he's done, 
word on fire, resource that can be used for people preparing homilies. Pope Francis, Evangelii Gaudium. I did do a prepared part of the presentation to do a comparison between um, Book 4 of Dei Doctrina Christiana comparing it to Evangelium Gaudium, but um, it's still on my computer. In other words, I knew it was one of the things I had to cut. Um, I mentioned this priest, Father George Schmiga, who's uh, at St. Mary's. And when I was doing my uh, uh, research, I went to interview him. And he had an interesting point. And I think it's, 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 it's something that we need to hear. He teaches scripture. And he said, Steve, he said, Guys would write these fantastic papers on Johannine theology. Fantastic papers on Johannine theology. They would do this great research in terms of exegesis for the course. And then when they went to preach, it was all this pious gobbledygook. And, and he says, for years I kept thinking, how is it that you, the same person that made an A in my course on, you know, John or Paul, and did this great exegesis, you get into the pulpit, and it's nothing but this pious stuff, garbage. He said, then I realized, they're preaching the homilies that they heard growing up. And it was burnt in their minds like tapes. And so he has a famous line, burn the tapes. Burn, burn the tapes. Take what you've learned. Remember what I started off with. Good academic theology makes for solid pastoral theology. And specifically in the area of preaching. When we look at the effort that has been made and is still being made, I look at people not only in terms of people like uh, Pope Francis, Bishop Barron. Um, I look at people here. In 1984, William Burkhart was awarded the William Toohey Award, a distinguished award for preaching by Notre Dame University. And I went back and said, well, this is interesting about this award. Let me look at a little deeper into this William Toohey Distinguished Preaching Award. Who all has received it? 2021, Father Gerard Olinger. 2020, Father Brogan Ryan. 2019, Father Daniel Grudy. 2018, Father James Foster. 2017, Father Paul Coleman. 2015, Mark Malloy. 2014, Joseph uh, Kapora. 2013, Thomas Blanche. What's the point I'm trying to make? The university is trying to send a message about preaching, good preaching, the importance of preaching, so much so that you give an annual award for it. What's the university trying to say? The idea of the Martin Lectures, the Martin Fellowship, not only here but also at St. Minerids. I look at other, other places, the Homiletic Institute, University of Dallas, Dr. Carlo Bellinger, who's with us this evening, has been appointed as the chair. Simple things. Go online. Look at text, the, the text this week. Look at prepare the sermon. Proclaim the sermon. Prepare the word. A former student of mine, Father Connor Penn, put together a blog site for Sunday homily preparation. It's four to five minutes. He's a St. Catherine of Siena in Clearwater. You can go online and get the blog. In four or five minutes, he'll give you a summary of the readings from the exegetical point of view. My friends, the, the point I'm trying to make is this. Homiletics is important. And if we, and as I've tried to demonstrate, if we look at the theologians that have said, wait a second, homiletics is important. The homily is in fact, is in fact, the integrating point of all theology. So you've done all this education 
here at the University of Notre Dame, St. Vincent Paul Regional Seminary, Notre Dame Seminary in uh, New Orleans, uh, St. John Seminary uh, in Boston. You've done all this education. Where is it going to come out? What's the integrating point? Is the homily. I've said it for years. Again, I defer to my class, my classes. As a priest, as a, as a minister, you're going to be standing in front of a congregation as being the local theologian. They're going to be asking you and coming to you with their difficulties, their problems. They're going to be calling you. Can you, consult, can, can you can come and console my family? We just lost our you know, three-year-old daughter who drowned in a pool. Grandma's in the hospital. Would you come and anoint her? Would you visit with us? They passed away. Well, we don't anoint dead bodies. No, but Father, can you come bring some consolation to the family, for gosh sakes? Just show up at the hospital. Come over to the house. Do something. We're calling on our local theologian, our pastor, our shepherd. Can you come console us? Be with us? You know, can you, will you do my wedding? Will you baptize my children? It's all those things, but also what they're looking for, and more so today than ever, ever, ever before. They're looking for good homilies. And my friends, people vote, whether we like it or not, with their feet and their pocketbook. And if you think what I'm about to say to you is made up, talk to any receptionist in any parish. St. Catherine's? Uh, yes. Uh, what mass is Father Basso saying on Sunday? He's saying the 9 and 10.30. Henrietta, we're not going to the 9 and 10.30. <laughs> if you don't think people do that, you're kidding yourself. They're looking for good homilies. They will search. Some people will go skip two Catholic parishes to go to a parish where they will get good liturgy and good homilies, good music, a good experience of the, of the Lord and the community. The point of this presentation, my friends, has been to examine the history of homiletics and preaching in the Catholic tradition, to look at the council, but to look after the council to say, Theologians are now sending us in homiletics a very clear message. And I think that I would say to any theological faculty, whether it's a doctoral program, whether it's a master's program, you know, you should be interested in what's being done in homiletics. If you're a systematic theologian, aren't you the least bit interested what's going to be said, being brought from your class to Trinity Sunday? to Corpus Christi? Aren't you interested at all in what these people are saying? Have they been trained well? With the idea of social justice gospel, aren't you folks in moral theology just a little bit concerned about what these people are saying from the pulpit? In sacramental theology, same thing. What's being said? As I make the plea for theological faculties, try to accentuate, try to develop preaching across the curriculum, where not only do you have the people in homiletics reviewing your homilies, you have people in pastoral, you have people in spirituality, you have people in systematics, you have people in moral, you have men and women, we have several nuns in our faculty, a couple of lay people, and when we do homily reviews, we bring these people in as well as the people in systematics sacramental, moral. And we have them review these homilies. We have them requiring homilies in their courses and systematics. Where instead of maybe a reflection paper or you know a 10-page paper, I'm going to have a five-page paper, but you also have a homily due. To where I can see what is it you're going to say when it comes to those very important feast days? What are you going to say on the Marian feast? Several years ago, um, um, and you probably remember the, the, the day it happened, the evening it happened, um, that they had all of the shootings in Las, uh, Las Vegas. Do you remember that? Happened on a late Sunday night. Of course, it's three hours over, two hours over from us. 
And uh, the next day was um, the Feast of the Guardian Angels. But I don't have television and I don't, uh, I watch television, but I don't have a television. Um, so I didn't catch it until like midday the next day after the mass, the community mass. And um, when I found out, what, when I, and I was there present when the, the deacon was preaching and, uh, you know, he uh, started preaching uh, on the Feast of the Guardian Angels and he went into the little prayer we learned, you know, when we were kids, you know, what is the, how does it start, uh, angel, my angel, guardian deer, you know, and you, Yeah, well, that was the homily, okay? Yeah, nice little pious homily from six. So when we got to homily X class, I asked the question. I said, uh, so this was the homily, huh? Yeah. I said, my question is this. Where were their guardian angels? All those people that were killed. Where was their guardian angel? Maybe they were watching one of the plays, you know. Maybe they were at one of the gambling casinos, slot machines. Ring, 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 ring. Where was the guardian angel? Well, the guys in the class got absolutely irate with me. Irate. How dare I? And I said to them, I said, you guys are about to be ordained priests. You think you're going to get away with saying a little prayer like that? When people come into your rectories with the problems and the difficulties they're having, they're going to be asking you big boy questions. And you're not going to get away with saying some prayer that you teach a six-year-old. I'm sorry. You're not. They expect you to be the theologians, the local theologians. And I said, and I'll be honest with you. If someone asked me, I said, I'll be honest with you. I don't know where they were. Well, sure enough, two weeks later, what comes out in one of the kind of very conservative Catholic magazines, title of the article, Where Were Their Guardian Angels? Very well-written article. I think a very good reply. Again, if, if we're going to be taken seriously in terms of being homilists, and homilics in terms of, uh, then we've got to get serious. And I think that the message that many theologians, the ones I alluded to, are sending to us is we're now, yes, we respect the homilics department, the homilics curriculum. And my point is to argue, if you do, let's work together. Let's work on preaching across the curriculum. Let's work together as, again, theologians, working together to train theologians for proper, good, solid pastoral ministry. What's the importance of homiletics in a theological curriculum? It's the subtitle. Good academic theology makes for solid pastoral theology in every dimension and aspect of the homiletics curriculum, or the theological curriculum, including homiletics. There is a part C, which I'm not going to do um, because of the time. I'm part Italian and part Irish, which means that I could talk forever. Folks in my class know this, and uh, so I'll spare you. But what I had was um, a nine-minute homily given by one of our deacons, who I thought was very good, and uh, a template which I developed. And the template, which I can distribute, it basically asks... What theology did you hear in this homily? And this is what we do in our fourth semester of homiletics at the seminary. I'm not touting it as the best program. But, and basically what we do is we look at a homily, and we don't now look at it in terms of uh, what, you know, were they, you know, swaying back and forth, uh, you know, were they stumbling over the words, did they have control over the material? We look at the theology. What theology did you hear? These are folks who are ordained, they're preaching in parishes, this is the real McCoy, you're not preaching to classmates in front of a camera in a classroom or in the chapel. And basically what I ask is, and I, had it, and I was going to just distribute the form and say, what theology did you hear? 
And the question I have for people in a theological curriculum is to say, I'd like for the people in a theological curriculum to look at this homily or any homily and ask from your perspective as a trained theologian, what theology did you hear that person say and preach? Or as I say, theologies. When the guys at the seminary ask me, how do I go about this? How do I do it? I say this. Act like this. What did you learn in Trinity, in Christology? What did you learn in Ecclesiology, in Mariology? What did you learn in Revelation or Biblical theology and Pauline theology or prophets? What did you hear? What did you read? What papers did you write? Sacramental theology in terms of the theology of baptism or Eucharist. What theology were you trained with? Are you hearing this theology come through in the homily? And if not, then we've got a lot of work to do. But the best part, and this is, I'll have to say, I've been doing this for three years now. I have been shocked at how successful folks do after they've been trained properly in homiletics, how well they do integrating the theology they've learned in terms of the theology that they're preaching and making it possible for people to hear this and swallow this and understand this. It's, it's a real compliment to our theological curriculums, but also it's a real compliment to the homiletics department in terms of training folks well and doing a really good job on training people how to take from a, go from a classroom to a pulpit in a parish where a 12-year-old can understand the homily and be given something in terms of nourishment, and spiritual nourishment. Again, I appreciate uh, that. I, we're not going to do that because of the time. But I do thank you for your uh, very kind attention, and um, I'll take a few questions if there are any. Thank you.